Oh, okay. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome um, to the uh, monthly 70 uh, seminar series at uh, Johns Hopkins and the Kirby Center, the Kenny Craig Institute. Uh, we didn't do this uh, last month, obviously, because uh, we have the gathering in the uh, in, Tor in Toronto. But this month we resume. And uh, we are very happy uh, this month uh, uh, to have uh, Dr. Andrew Fagan as our honored speaker. Um, I'll do, uh, as usual, I'll do a very, very brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Fagan is a professor of radiology, uh, a professor of medical physics uh, and the radiology at uh, Mayo Clinic. And he got his PhD training in uh, uh, University of Aber Aberdeen, right, in uh, MR physics. I guess um, uh, Dr. Fagan is the most well known uh, for his work, uh, you know, on uh, MR safety, um, especially on 7T, which will be the main topic for today. And then uh, personally, I, I have attended several of your lectures, uh, actually, you know, at, at various conferences. And uh, I should say every time uh, I, I find myself learning lots of new things. So, um, so I, 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 and I think uh, this topic is a particularly important, uh, especially for 7T, because, um, you know, unlike 3T, when you initiate a new study, you know, in terms of MR safety, when you're trying to get an RB approved, there are lots of uh, reference of a guideline you can get. But 7T is somewhat, uh, you know, there's uh, much less uh, literature. So um, in that regard, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Fagan's work is uh, instrumental and extremely helpful, you know, for many of us, um, you know, for our work on 7T. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Fagan and looking forward to your talk, as always. Thank you so much. Well. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anne, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a very pr privilege for me to be here with you today. Um, so th thank you for the invitation. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just talk about uh, navigating safety challenges uh, at 7 Okay. So just here's a quick overview of what I'd like to cover in the next 50 minutes or so. Um, so I'll just give a short introduction to 17 or um, and then from a safety point of view, obviously talking about uh, magnetic field forces, bio effects, radio frequency effects. Uh, I'll talk a bit about metallic implants at 70 because there's a lot of challenges to everyone working at 70 uh, for imaging people who may have uh, so, some implants in their body. Uh, and I'll just talk about some logistics and practicalities for some of the routine clinical imaging that we're doing. And again, I'll just emphasize that all of the safety effects that we have at 70 are common to all of MRI. Most of them are just exasperated and, and, and there are some one or two uh, things which are particularly exasperated as we move to seven Tesla. Um, okay, so just to start very briefly about 70, uh, I guess this, this is my introduction to seven Tesla uh, when I did my PhD in Aberdeen. Um, this is a, a, a 30 centimeter uh, horizontal bore, 70s uh, magnet is a really old one when I got there. Um, this was in the group of Jim Hutchison, uh, who uh, built the first uh, DeMarco One scanner. Oh, okay. Okay, is that better? Your talk, yeah. Is that better? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so this was a, a group uh, with Jim and uh, David Lurie, who was my supervisor at the time. Uh, this this uh, was the Mark One scanner, which was right beside the 70 magnet. Uh, we used to use this to demonstrate to students. So it was still working when I was there. Um, I think it's in a museum now um, uh, on the campus. Uh, and we were developing MR technology, um, building, uh, I was working on a zero echo time system. So uh, using magnetic field sweeps to sweep through resonance and detect uh, the change in the uh, properties of the resonators as we swept through resonance. So, so we built all the electronics and the hardware, the gradients, and et cetera. Uh, so that was my first introduction to 7T. And then I worked on uh, Brooker scanners in Glasgow and Dublin. Uh, my main research focus was on sodium imaging. So we built a lot of coils for that over the years as well. And then I worked in uh, University of Dublin and St. James's Hospital in a clinical research center for a number of years. Uh, and then finally ended up in Mayo, uh, uh, moved there in 2017 uh, when they bought the, the clinical or the, the, the Siemens Terra Magnus uh, back at that time. So I moved over there to work on that system. Um, so a quick roadmap of 70 MR. Um, 2003, the FDA designated MRI up to 8 Tesla as a non-significant risk to adults, children and infants greater than one month of age. 
Uh, and then in 2009, the International Commission of Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection uh, uh, said, uh, followed that no serious health effects from exposure to static fields up to a Tesla. And then in the 2015 version of the IEC 60601-2-33, uh, they said that first level controlled operating mode up to uh, uh, for static mode uh, for fields up to eight Tesla. Um, so so, so the, these uh, steps paved the way for the regulatory clearance of uh, uh, 70 uh, clinical systems, uh, which happened for two manufacturers in 2017 and 2020. Uh, and initially this was fairly restricted for head and uh, extremity imaging only with a, a, a certain mass uh, limit, 30 kilos, uh, and in so-called single transmit ORF mode only. And that's still the situation today, six years later, although that may change over the next year or so. Um, so as regards numbers of scanners, I'm not sure if 100 is still accurate. There's uh, quite a few going into uh, a lot more clinical sites uh, with the advent of these clinical scanners. Uh, but I guess there's been a lot of research scanners for probably upwards of 15 years, uh, if not more, uh, at various institutions around the world. Okay, so moving on to talk about magnetic field forces. Um, so just plotting here the fringe field uh, in the space uh, in front of uh, the, uh, the bore of a, of a th modern 3T uh, compared to uh, the, the Siemens Terra magnet, that this is the one that we have. Um, so you can see that the, the fringe field contour plots are broadly similar for the two magnets. This is an actively shielded magnet, so the field lines are, are a bit closer in compared to the first generation of uh, uh, passively shielded um, uh, scanners. Uh, so this has implications for, for also staff who are, who are working in the area uh, in, in front of the scanner. So, so it's, it's, it's not so, so dissimilar to the uh, 3T magnets. Um, and this has implications for uh, the sizing. You can see that the 0 0.5 millitasla or five gauss line um, is just a bit further out. So again, the footprint um, for installing these machines is, is getting smaller all the time. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of older uh, unshielded designs. So it's very important, I think, to understand uh, where the fringe fields of your magnet actually are. And this is a nice schematic from Siemens just showing that it's a physically, it's a much larger magnet. Uh, I'm guessing G's current magnet uh, is probably of similar size as well as, as the one Philips have been using. Okay, so moving on to talk about translational forces. Um, as you may know, the, the force on uh, objects like a paramagnetic object or, or ferromagnetic that's not saturated is this force product of the, the, the magnetic field multiplied by the spatial field gradient, so the dB, dZ uh, term. And if you have a, a ferromagnetic that's saturated, so usually above two and a half Tesla ferromagnets are saturated, uh, you just replace the static field with the saturated field. Uh, multiplied by the spatial field gradient. And this is um, a, a plot of a, a 1.5 T magnet that we have. You're looking at one quadrant here. Um, so just to orientate you, this is the isocenter. Uh, so, so this is the front face out here. And this is a location typically around the entrance to the bore where you get the largest spatial field gradient on a lot of horizontal bore uh, 1.5 and 3 T magnets, um, as I've indicated here. So this is a our terra magnet, and you can see that the location of this uh, maximum gradient is about half a meter in from the front face. So, so this is the area where we're likely to get the largest uh, translational forces. Uh, and, and certainly it's the, the gradient is about 12 Tesla per meter here. Um, and so in a field of about five Tesla at that location, so we get about 60 Tesla squared per meter. Uh, and if you look at modern uh, 3T scanners, there's a broad range uh, out there uh, of, uh, of the typical uh, force product uh, values. So you can see that there's certainly potential for 70 to uh, have uh, uh, twice or three times uh, the potential force um, of, uh, of some treaty scanners. But there are some open bore magnets where um, in a patient accessible area around the housing, you can get uh, force products greater than 100 Tesla squared per meter. Uh, this is a paper from Terry Woods and the FDA a few years ago where um, she just uh, looked at the upper bounds of all current magnets at that time um, for 1, 5, 3, and 17. You can see the, the static fields, the maximum, the, the spatial field gradients, and, and these force products. Uh, so there are some 70 magnets. I'm not sure which ones, which go up to 85 Tesla squared per meter. Okay. Force due to torque scales with the square of the magnetic field. So uh, it is uh, likely that we have over five times uh, the force due to torque uh, on an object when located close to the isocenter. So that's, again, something that I think that we need to be very aware of. 
Uh, and, and in fact, I'm sometimes more worried about forests due to torque than due to translation on certain types of implants people have in particular. Um, so, so this is something I'll talk a bit more about later on in the talk. And consequences are that some implants may be unsafe at seven tesla, uh, even if they're more conditional at, at three tesla from the perspective of magnetic field forces. So we, we do need to be aware of that. Okay, so moving on to talk about bioeffects. Um, uh, exposure to the static B0 field and movement through the gradients. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have the same effects that we have at lower fields, but they're all just merely exasperated as we move to uh, uh, move to 7 Tesla. So uh, some people report uh, the metallic taste that people are aware of. Um, the magnetohydrodynamic effect is, is that bit worse again. So we, we have an elevated T wave, uh, which can make um, ECG monitoring a bit more difficult. Uh, but there's been no detectable change in, in blood pressure in humans, which is a good thing. I think at 10.5 T, there, there is some small physiological changes, but, but nothing that's uh, been determined to be significant. So at 7 T, we're certainly well below that threshold. Uh, probably the thing which affects most people, patients and subjects, are vestibular activation. Um, so some degree of dizziness and the stigmas uh, or vertigo or this feeling of moving on a curve. So when I go into the 7 T, everything feels like it, it twists and other people experience it in a flipping vertical or horizontally. It's, it's um, curious that different people experience it in different planes. Uh, and this is described many years ago as being um, due to uh, ionic fluid in the inner ear uh, and uh, activation, uh, Lorentz force acting on the, uh, the ions in that, which uh, activate the sensor cells, which uh, our brain interprets as some, some mo motion. And this really uh, affects you as, as you're going in and particularly an hour magnet when you're about half a meter in into the bore where the gradients get particularly strong is, is when you feel it most. Uh, and it, even when you bring people out, uh, we, we did a study early on looking at nystigmus, residual nystigmus after we, we, we took uh, people out of the magnet and uh, even up towards five minutes, we could still detect some of this uh, random eye motion. Uh, so it's, it's definitely there. You look at the, the velocity of the pupil mo movement and uh, it gradually just returns to baseline. And it's quite subjective. Some people, uh, uh, we, we, everybody we image on our 17, we put into a wheelchair, just uh, our, uh, our safety policy. Um, by the time we got them into the control room and to put the goggles on to measure the eye motion, um, one or two minutes. Some people had already returned to baseline and a few others just took another two or three minutes. Uh, but pretty much everyone had returned to baseline after about five minutes or so. So, uh, but it is an effect and, and it's definitely there. So it's something to be aware of. Uh, can leave, lead to extreme nausea. And I, I'm, uh, I have personal experience of this one. Uh, so this was, um, you can see here again, the, uh, the R70, uh, the fields in the bore. Uh, normally your head is right down the middle on the, on the axis, the Z axis of the magnet. Um, and with a table motion, the table moves in fairly slowly. So uh, it's you get some dizziness, it's not too bad. But if you uh, move your head off the table by 15 centimeters or so, uh, it's uh, it seems to go through this area of particularly high spatial field gradients and that's nausea inducing. Uh, we had it happen on three people. This was when we were doing wrist imaging and we were going in in the Superman position. Um, so you're, you're lying like this. And so to make the person comfortable, they're up off the table a bit. So we, we figured out that this is really not a good idea. <laughs> uh, and there's nothing in the literature which says what the threshold for humans to induce nausea. I guess it'd be difficult to get an IRB study to, uh, to look at that. But I think our data shows it's maybe around 10 Tesla per meter at that velocity is, is enough to do it. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the table doesn't, on our scanner anyway, does not move up and down. Um, and I, that might be just to reduce the instances of vestibular activation uh, on, on uh, subjects and patients whose whose heads are uh, in this area uh, just outside the, the bore. Um, and we, we advise patients and our, our subjects uh, once we get them on the table um, and uh, their head is in the coil or uh, they're, they're lying for a knee scan just to not move their head as much as uh, at all, basically. Um, uh, and certainly when, when they're coming out, we make sure the table is fully out before the techs take them off the table and bring them out of the magnet room. Uh, it has implications for us. Uh, so occupational staff exposure is an important uh, consideration. Um, so we advise our staff not to put their head into the bore wherever possible. And, uh, you know, if you're if there was a spill inside and you have to clean it, uh, we would try to use re remote tools as much as possible. Um, if there's an engineer who needs to get in there and do some work, 
um, you know, I think there's uh, uh, precautions that you can take, like not driving a car for an hour afterwards, uh, things like this, just if someone has been exposed to these fields, because you can be dizzy and maybe not even be aware of it. Um, so it's, it's just to be uh, conscious that these things can actually happen. Um, so we, there was a study that came out in 2018, which caused some controversy uh, from Yilmaz et al. It was published in Radiology, uh, where they found uh, that mercury was released from uh, dental amalgam, amalgam fillings uh, after exposure to 70. And I guess a few groups now have tried to reproduce this. And, and we published some, some work and well, presented at the RSNA and where we've got a paper under review at the moment uh, where we did not find any uh, any effects um, <clears throat> when we tried to reproduce this, just uh, exposing it to a, um, to a standard neurological examination. So uh, hopefully this is the case now and other studies will prove that there is no effect um, at 70 due, due to mercury uh, coming out of these fillings. Uh, switching gradients are uh, certainly on the current scanners. There are broadly similar strengths and slew rates. Um, so there's no additional risks um, uh, from the switching gradient fields um, and certainly no risk of uh, uh, car cardiac ventricular fibrillation, which is a good thing as well for us. Um, acoustic noise is not appreciably higher. We, we did measure this on our, our Siemens scanner when it came in. Um, there's a Lorentz dampening effect, which is de described in these, in these uh, publications. Uh, where the strong, stronger vibrations uh, due to the grading coils induced eddy currents, uh, which they explained uh, gave some more structural dampening uh, uh, of, the, of, of the gradients. Uh, and certainly the lack of body coil, there could be more insulation down, uh, acoustic insulation in the bore. But certainly, um, uh, even though you might expect there to be greater forces at 7 Tesla, it, it wasn't too much different from our uh, PRISM, our, our, our 3T scanners, which is a good thing. Uh, the head coil is small, as, as you probably know. So it's a uh, Bit smaller than what the ones we have with 3T. So fitting in headphones is an issue. And I think hearing protection is obviously uh, uh, something that I'm always very conscious of <clears throat> when we're imaging any humans. Okay, so moving on to talk about uh, radio frequency effects. Um, so as we go to higher alarm frequencies, uh, we get increased absorb power absorption into tissue. Um, and it increases uh, quadratically up to around three Tesla. And it's a slightly less than quadratic increase above three Tesla, but certainly uh, we're uh, absorbing a lot more uh, uh, RF power, uh, which is ultimately turning into heat uh, at seven Tesla compared to three Tesla, which, which is a challenge for us. And of course, we're subject to the same regulatory limits. Uh, this is the uh, updated IEC 60601-2-33 document. Uh, the latest version came out last year and it didn't change the, um, the, the, the global and local SAR levels. So here they are listed. So the, the top table is for so-called volume transmit coils, uh, where there are limits for uh, the global average SAR, so averaged over the whole body, exposed uh, within the coil or just ahead, for example, you can see two watts per kilo in normal mode or four watts per kilo in first level controlled mode or 3.2 for the head. Um, and then there are other uh, more local SAR limits, typically averaged over a mass of 10 grams of tissue. Um, and uh, these are for local transmit coils where we have our 10 and 20 watts per kilo or 20 and 40 watts per kilo limits. Um, and it's usually the case that these local SAR limits are usually reached uh, much sooner than we reach the, uh, the global SAR limits. And as I'll explain later, the, uh, we have to control for these local uh, SAR limits uh, as well as global SAR at seven Tesla, which we do not have to do at, at three Tesla and lower. And this creates additional imaging difficulties for us because we're usually hitting that SAR limit very quickly. So the wavelength is shorter. Uh, again, as we uh, go up in frequency, we're around 300 megahertz. Uh, the wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency and some dielectric properties of the materials. And uh, so for the wavelength for soft tissue is typically in a range of around 10 to 15 centimeters. Uh, fat will be a bit longer again, maybe around 40 centimeters. And this would compare to like a three task that would be about twice this. So around uh, 20, 30 centimeters, depending on the tissue type. But, but you can see these dimensions are already getting close to the dimensions of the head. And because we have the, uh, these short wavelengths, similar to these dimensions, where we're getting uh, wave interference effects. So the waves coming in from the, from the transmit coil surrounding the anatomy are interfering in, in uh, the field of view. And so you can get areas of constructive interference where waves add together and destructive where they 
tend to cancel out. And so this is a, an axial slice through the head where you can see we're getting, uh, it's a B1 map or a flip angle map, if you like. So we're getting maybe 90 degree flip angles towards the center. Uh, and then in other areas of the brain, like, particularly as you can see here, uh, and also over here, we're getting lower flip angles. And this can be as, as stark as like 20, 30 degree flip angles compared to 90, rather than just getting uniform 90 across the field of view. So obviously when we get lower flip angles, we're, we're losing signal to noise, we're losing contrast to noise uh, in these areas of the brain. And it can vary on the tissue heterogeneity. So uh, it can be variable from patient to patient as well. So consequences of the, these wavelength effects are that we can uh, have local SAR hotspots um, and we can no longer rely on global SAR estimates or measurements from the scanner. Um, and the transmit coils, even the head birdcage coil that we have on our 70s, uh, can no longer be considered as a purely volume coil. Uh, it also has elements of, of local coil. And so per the IEC regulations, it, um, uh, we, we have to control the, uh, the local 10 gram average SAR as well as the global SAR. And here's just a, a simulation study done a few years ago. Um, where you can see uh, the effect of increasing frequency. So 64 megahertz or one and a half Tesla, you can see a lot of the, the SAR is really around the periphery of the head. This is an axial slice showing the same thing. Uh, whereas at 300 megahertz, you see the, the, uh, the electric fields. And so the SAR distribution is more, is more scattered throughout the, throughout the head. And so, and so we've got different areas uh, of potential hotspots. And again, as you go to higher frequencies, again, it's even more pronounced. So global SAR, um, the scanners can measure this fairly easily. Um, it, the scanner knows how much power is going in and it can measure the power reflected back from your transmit coil. And so the difference is what's transmitted into the coil. Um, and so this gives you the, the power absorbed in the exposed body region within the coil. And that can be measured dynamically during imaging. Um, and uh, you can validate any, if you're building your own coils, or just validate the scanner's measurements um, using simple calorimetry experiments where you have a phantom, uh, you'd have some fiber optic temperature probes in there, you insulate it uh, so that whatever energy you're putting into it from the RF exposure is staying inside, it equilibrates with inside, and you just average the temperature over the volume, and you're looking at the change in temperature and with the specific heat capacity of the material and, and the time, you can calculate what the SAR is. So this is pretty straightforward to do uh, if you're just get, trying to get an estimate of the global SAR. But local SAR is, 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 is much more difficult. You cannot measure it dynamically in the scanner. You need uh, a priori simulations, uh, which solve uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, and usually in anthropomorphic body models. I'll show you some examples of that later on. Um, and we use these simulations to determine uh, what the, the absolute maximum uh, local SAR you could possibly get um, and in a worst case scenario for say a nominal one watt of power going into your coil. And then you use that to, to uh, control the overall power that the scanner will deliver into the coil to make sure that we, we would stay below these local limits in all cases. So it is a fairly conservative approach, but it's the one that, that, we, that we have to take. Um, so just, just an example of some work we did when we built a, a hand and wrist coil. It's a simple bird cage. You can see it here. I'll, I'll talk a bit about these steps in, in a few slides. So you build a coil, you, you build a simulation model of the coil, you run simulations on body models, trying to determine what the absolute worst case SAR might be. And you use this to determine an upper limit on the power that the scanner will transmit into the coil. And then you do some validation to make sure that um, that, that actually works uh, or a, that, that the, the upper limit uh, is is not exceeding any any uh, uh, temperature or SAR limits. Uh, so this is building the coil and, and the, the the model. When you're building a model, a simulation model of a coil, you have to make sure that the simulation model reflects the physical coil itself. And so you you typically just use B1 plus mapping. So you're measuring the transmit field in a typically uniform phantom like you have here. And you can see this is the simulated B1 plus field, and this is the measured field. And as long as they can uh, correlate fairly closely spatially. Uh, you can be confident for, for the single transmitted systems that it's a, it's, a, it's a good representation of your physical coil. Uh, you'd run the simulation. So th this is an example of um, a family of virtual uh, anthropomorphic body models from the ISIS Foundation. You can see different body shapes and sizes, young children and uh, older adults. Uh, and typically you would, you would run simulations of, of different models, shapes and positions within your transmit coil, uh, again, to determine this worst case scenario 
uh, and use that worst case then to uh, constrain the RF power that's, that's transmitted in. And you can see some examples here. I think we, we had the worst case just in a regular adult model. Uh, you can see along the edges here uh, of the arm. I think that was where we got the, the, the worst case SAR in all the simulations that we performed. And again, that's used to, to, to scale everything down. So yeah, you, you scale the RF power to keep this, the local SAR within limits. Uh, so just an example, if we, had, we simulate with one watt of power, and when we simulate one watt, we got a maximum SAR average all, all those body models and positions of 1.4 watts per kilo. Uh, and so you can determine a conversion factor that the scanners use uh, of the, 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 the maximum SAR you measured divided by the one watt that we input. So, so we get a, this uh, number of 1.4 inverse kilos. And this is uh, the, the coil conversion factor. Siemens call it the K factor. I'm not sure what Phillips call it. Uh, and, and that's uh, we just, we added an extra safety factor just to, just um, because of potential uh, modeling errors. Uh, and this number then is written into a file which is on the scanner, which controls how much power um, the the scanner uh, will allow to be transmitted into that particular coil. So this is just the process you must go through. And again, this then uh, is designed to make sure that we, we don't exceed any of the uh, regulatory limits that we have uh, for for this single transmit coil system. And then you could do thermometry. This is a thermometry technique we developed uh, to actually measure the temperatures using MOR. Um, so this is a, using proton resonant frequency technique, uh, which is a gradient recall echo where you uh, just take magnitude and phase information. And there's a linear relationship between the phase that you that the scanner measures, so the phase here, uh, and, and the temperature uh, with, with some uh, constants, as you see here. Uh, and then you can relate to this temperature that you've measured to the SAR using the equation I showed you earlier on. Uh, so the changing temperature with the specific heat capacity just uh, and the time just gives you the, the, the SAR value. And here's a, an example of the, of the phantom. We, have some, we had some fiber optic probes of four locations just to validate our thermometry technique. Uh, oil vials on the corners to correct for drift of the static field during the experiment. And you can see then here the typical uh, phase data Phase wrapping is a problem, uh, more so as you go to the 70s. So a lot of what we did was to try and uh, be able to, to deal with these phase wraps. Um, and again, we're, we're measuring SAR uh, due to the actual imaging sequence. So we're always limited in how much power the scanner will allow us to transmit in. So we just use some off resin and saturation pulses to, to get the heating. Nevertheless, the amount of heating is, is really quite low, less than one degree Celsius. Uh, and we had to deal with the large phase wrapping, as I, as I mentioned before. This is just some, some data. You can see um, this is uh, correlating our fiber optic temperature data with the actual temperature measurements from thermometry, the single dots here. Uh, uh, and, and this is for a probe uh, towards the edge of the phantom. And then when we had a probe uh, in the center of the phantom, we got this data down here. So almost no uh, SAR or, or temperature change at that location. And again, this is a simulated uh, local SAR map uh, versus the measured map. So again, this gives us some confidence that the limits that we put into the coil file are actually valid because the maximum SAR we measured was around 14.2 when the scanner uh, displayed value was uh, 38.4. So again, this is the again just to talk you through the process that you have to go through when you're when you're building your own coils. Okay, so a second consequence of the ORF effects are that these these birds, the body sized bird cage coils that we have on th all 3T and 1.5T scanners are just not effective anymore when they're this kind of diameter. Uh, so they, they just don't uh, produce a uniform excitation field and they're just not very efficient at uh, power transfer either. Uh, and they just about work, I say, for a head coil. So again, you're familiar with this uh, Nova coil, which I think most uh, 70 sides have. There's an outer layer, which is a transmitter, it's a, uh, a bird cage, I guess. Uh, and there's a, a receiver array on the inside. Uh, and this uh, coil is actually in the foot head direction is quite short, um, which I think contributes to some lack of signal low down in the brain. Um, uh, and so this is, a, I guess you're probably familiar with these problems. Um, so we have a slightly inhomogeneous B1 plus field. We've got a short coil and we've got B0 effects all giving image quality problems. And we typically see this uh, in the lower parts of the temporal lobes uh, here and here. Uh, and also in the cerebellum as well. Uh, and so what we've done, which is what most 70 sites have done, is to develop some dielectric pads. Uh, and we use three pads. These are pads we built ourselves. Uh, here's just pictures of them here. Um, barium titanate and calcium titanate with some gelling agents uh, and some heavy water. Uh, and so this gives us um, so-called passive shimming of the B1 plus field. 
uh, and this is the approximate locations. Uh, we're just careful not to place them too close to the eyes, uh, just in case, because they do have a, an effect of focusing the transmit field in. So, so we certainly don't want to uh, focus that too much near the eyes. But otherwise, these are the pretty much locations where we use them. Permittivity of around 160 for, for these ones. And then for the knee imaging, we have different shape pads, slightly lower permittivity. This was a very empirical looking at different shapes of pads and locations and permittivity values to see what worked best. Um, and you can see the kind of improvement uh, in the B1 plus map. And this is just a, a T2 weighted image on, on the bottom without pads on the left and then with the pads in these approximate positions. So uh, it's not perfect, but it certainly improves uh, uh, the image quality and we really got it over the line so that we could use this diagnostically on patients. So I'll mention one safety caveat. Um, obviously the pads uh, were not included in the simulations performed by the vendors to determine the worst case SAR. And so uh, this has been debated uh, quite a bit in the high field community, but um, you know, there's been quite a few studies now. This is one from Andrew Webb's group back in 2016 uh, showing uh, situation on the left column with no pads and then with these pads, uh, these particular pads, quite large pads you see here with a permittivity of around 110. And you can see that the, the, the location of the large, uh, the peak SAR, which is actually the top of the head, hasn't really changed when they put the pads either side. And the fact that the actual peak SAR had, had decreased because I think it just redistributes some of the energy uh, around the head. And then they did simulations with a, a cutout for, for hearing protection, I think. Uh, with again different permittivity values and again uh, very very minor perturbation uh, of the local SAR values uh, and so we, we use these pads clinically and also in all of our research studies. So moving on from passive shimming we can do active shimming uh, using so-called parallel transmit technology um, and this is potentially useful for uh, B1 plus homogeneity and also uh, for power reduction. So, so some uh, you can do some constraints on your design of your RF pulses to, to reduce SAR. Uh, and this works on the basis of independently uh, controlling the phase and amplitude sent into each of your arrays. So in it's a single transmit situation where you have maybe one transmitter surrounding your anatomy, it could be a birdcage coil or a TEM coil. You've just got one RF pulse and an amplifier uh, transmitting it into the body, which the problems that we've seen before. And then if you have a uh, rather an array coil, so eight transmitters arranged around your anatomy uh, with eight uh, amplifiers, you can in theory put in eight different waveforms uh, uh, into each one. And you can use that then to, 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 to shim the B1 plus field um, and uh, improve significant image quality improvements. Um, so this could be the future of 7TM, or particularly if we go down to the body where um, I think just single transmit is just not going to be able to give us a, 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 as uniform as possible uh, or a sufficiently uniform transmit field. Uh, but even in, in the head, I think you can already see that there's some improvements uh, with this. Um, there is, again, a safety caveat because the electrical field distribution uh, that, you, that results in this is highly dependent on the phase and amplitude settings for each of your transmit channels. And so you can get... Uh, very complex and dynamically cha uh, changing SAR patterns. So normally, uh, even when an RF pulse is being applied, uh, because they're dynamically changing pulses, uh, you will get dynamically changing SAR patterns. Um, and so there's a lot of work uh, going into um, uh, to, to, to research this to make sure we can implement this in a safe way without generating these hotspots. Uh, this just gives an example of some simulations um, we did uh, Andreas Bitz actually ran these simulations in Germany. Uh, this is with an eight channel loop array going around the head. You can see the yellow is one element and the blue is the second one. Uh, and you, you can drive this array in a, you know, quadrature mode like a birdcage where you get this, the uh, B1 plus field like high in the center with some areas of low B1 plus due to destructive interference and the corresponding SAR fairly uniform across the head. But it is possible to drive this array uh, with a certain shim, so a certain excitation vector on each of your transmit channels to produce this kind of pattern of B1 plus field. Uh, now, you probably would never do this in any realistic scenario, but it is possible to get this. Uh, and you can see the effect this would have on SAR, so you can really get a localized hotspot. Um, so again, a lot of the work is a very active area of research, uh, trying to make sure that we can run this in, in, in a way that we will never generate a hotspot uh, that could uh, exceed the regulatory limits. Um, so you can, um, uh, th there's been a lot of theory worked out over many years to, to how to do this. 
so the, the so-called Q matrix formalism, um, the SAR is uh, uh, just related to the square of the electric fields that the coil produces in, in, the, uh, in the tissue uh, with the uh, conductivity and density of the tissue as well. Um, and so you can um, express uh, or, or derive this as quantity to Q is in this quadratic form where you're looking at the electric fields and the density, uh, the conductivity and the density of, of the tissue. Uh, and then the SAR is, is simply the, uh, the, how you excite it. This will be derived for, to so say, a uniform excitation vector. So the same waveform going in on each of your transmit channels. Uh, and so you can run simulations to calculate this at every voxel uh, for, for, for uh, all of your eight channel or your transmitters. Uh, and then you can calculate the SAR from these simulations simply by multiplying by uh, whatever other excitation vectors you want to use in any uh, situation. So, so this means you can calculate the peak SAR uh, 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 in a worst case excitation drive vector, and you can derive them from the Q matrices. Uh, and then the problem with this approach is that because you get a, a matrix for every voxel in the human body, and the body, um, th there could be many millions of these, and doing these calculations is very uh, computation intensive. And so there's various techniques like the virtual observation points, try and compress the number of matrices that you need to monitor. Um, uh, and uh, you, you know, by there's various methods which have been described like over 12 years ago, um, uh, which can theoretically assure that, that, that you, uh, the compressed set uh, will represent the worst case SAR, no matter what uh, drive vector, no matter what way you drive your, your PTX coil. Uh, and it's what's built in is a certain overestimation error. Uh, and then you can you can use your online SAR calculation to uh, calculate the SAR based on this compressed set. So that makes it a bit more uh, feasible to perform in a reasonable time frame. Uh, so it is a very active area of research, and there's a lot of work going in to try and cut down the amount of time it takes. Uh, if you're using PTX coils, the validation of the coils is a bit more involved. Um, so B1 plus mapping, and, and you've got to start looking at uh, different drive modes, quadrature, uh, you know, different phase delays, uh, trying to match simulation to physical experimentation, and uh, also looking at scattering parameters uh, for your coil as well. Uh, X nuclei have, uh, in, general, in general, lower frequencies. Uh, so deuterium or, or carbon, uh, oxygen, lower frequencies. So, so we don't tend to have the same kind of RF effects um, at 70 uh, compared to hydrogen. Um, so they're usually not as difficult from an RF perspective. Okay, so moving on to talk about implants, um, uh, we have the same safety considerations as, as lower fields, of course, uh, so potentially safe magnetic forces and potentially safe or induced tissue heating due to the implants. Um, and you're probably aware of these databases that exist um, where there's many thousands of devices that have been uh, tested by manufacturers and certified as MR conditional, uh, and the conditionality is very much dependent on uh, certain limits on magnetic forces or RF induced tissue heating uh, that they can be applied to. But um, these all are for lower fields, so three Tesla and lower. Uh, and there's very, very little out there at the moment on 7T. So here's just some examples. Um, and these are really small devices, typically in the uh, uh, middle ear implants. Um, so they're, they're so small that they're made of titanium alloy. So there's no magnetic forces on them and there's really no possibility to, uh, to, to get hot. Uh, from more of induced heating. Uh, so it is fairly limited. And uh, so this creates a major problem for us imaging humans with, um, with any implants in the body. Uh, and there, there may be low incentive for manufacturers to actually uh, certify devices. And uh, it certainly might take many, many years before we see much movement in this, in this front. And uh, there's no body coil, uh, which makes standardization that bit difficult as well. Uh, if you look into literature, um, there are studies out there um, uh, specifically thinking here about magnetic forces, uh, which have measured uh, and determined uh, very stents, orthopedic devices, IUDs, dental wires, which are have been measured and, and felt to be safe. The authors concluded they were safe. And then there's others uh, which were found to have some uh, forces which were uh, unsafe, let's say. Um, and again, it does overlap. Uh, so some stents are safe and some stents unsafe, depending on, on what they're made of and depending on, on the study as well. Um, I'll just a few comments here. Mostly these studies look at just translational force. Torque is, is more difficult to measure. Um, and most of the studies don't mention torque. Um, and, you know, there, I have a query on some of the measurement methodology used and our ability to generalize. 
uh, to all magnets. So just to uh, give you an, a sense of this, the, uh, there's the um, testing standards, the ASTM standard you may be aware of. Uh, there's one for testing translational forces. It's the so-called angle of deflection. So you have your implants, you, you have some string, you, you, you suspend the, the implant here, you see it here from, from a stand, uh, and you're just looking at the angle at which the magnetic field is pulling it into the magnet. And if it's greater than 45 degrees, well, then the force due to the magnet is greater than the force due to gravity. Um, and the standards uh, specifically says men uh, to measure this at the entrance of the MR system bore. And then a few sentences later, it says uh, the location should be within 20% of the maximum spatial field gradient. And, uh, you know, this is not compatible with our, certainly with our 7G, because uh, this is the entrance to the bore. Uh, the field, the, the spatial gradient is around three tesla per meter here. And on the axis, the maximum is about 9.2, uh, which is again about half a meter in. Uh, so certainly if you measure at the entrance to the bore, uh, it's certainly not within 20%. Uh, and, and again, even the worst case uh, situation is, is right up here. Um, and you can't really measure it there, but you can extrapolate measurements that you make, say on the axis, to what it might be in a worst case scenario here. Um, and we did some measurements. We, we, we verified these are the field, field plots that come with the scanner. We, we, we verify them. They're pretty accurate. Um, and uh, when we ma made some measurements uh, of certain implants uh, at the entrance to the bore, as opposed to at this position on the axis where, where the gradient is largest, you can see the flip angles. No, not the flip angles. The, the angle of deflections are, are exceeding 45 degrees. So um, according to the standard, it would not be safe to, to image. And again, if you go off axis to this area of the extrapolate to the position of the maximum spatial field gradient, you can see it's that bit higher again. So I think it's very important when people are making these uh, uh, measurements that they specify exactly where they've measured. Um, uh, and again, if you look at a 3T for the same devices, uh, this is at the, at the position of the maximum gradient, you can see that the, 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 the uh, angle of deflections were all quite low. So it's very difficult for us to look at a data that's out there at 3T and then decide, you know, is it safe at 7T because the, the, the forces are, uh, can be quite a bit more significant. And it really depends on, on how the data was measured. Um, so some studies, um, this study here, 2017, various orthopedic devices on a G magnet, uh, the maximum gradient was 3.1 tesla per meter, uh, which was like 136 centimeters from isocenter. So this is quite different from our magnet. Um, but, but again, like some of the forces they measured would have been quite low on their magnets, whereas on our one, they'd probably be higher. So again, I think it's important when people are reading studies not to generalize too much, or, or certainly it's great that they actually specified uh, the conditions that they were measured at, but it, it's really important to keep that in mind when you're determining whether something is safe on your magnet. And then on, uh, this is the Vanderbilt group who published uh, studies on many devices. Uh, but again, they just measured at the highest accessible spatial gradient. So again, without the specific details, it's hard for us uh, in the community to really know uh, whether we can uh, generalize that to our own magnet. Um, torque measurements is another ASTM standard for how to measure torque. There's qualitative measurements where you put on a low friction surface and you're just looking at how it might move uh, the force you to torque uh, versus the force, uh, the frictional force on the surface, uh, which which would tend to, to pull it down because it's, it's placed at an angle. Uh, and again, many studies or the few studies that are out there, uh, 7T have really just done these qualitative torque measurements and and races on the scale of zero to four. So it, it's not quantitative. Uh, actually, the standard says that if if your device does align with B zero, that you should go to a more quantitative measurement technique. Um, but again, I don't think I've seen any of those perform at 70 in the literature. Um, th there are devices that you can um, build, or, or I'm not sure if you can buy these. I've never seen where you can buy them, but um, uh, to quantitatively measure uh, torque, you know, you have a spring here, uh, you have your device uh, on a platform that's free to rotate. So again, you, you can detect that uh, force due to torque. Uh, there's other variants in this. This is the pulley method. So you, again, you have your device here on a, on a table that's free to rotate uh, and it's free to rotate. And you just measured it with some force sensor over here. And there's various uh, variants on this uh, in other published studies as well. Um, I'll just make some comments in general. I think the limits like this idea of 45 degrees and even, even the, the force due to torque are fairly conservative. Um, 
And uh, really the, the, the risk, I guess, in any situation depends on how the device is fixed within the tissue and what the properties of the adjacent tissue actually are. Mm. And I, I think those situations where uh, we, we could put up with higher forces and torques than, are, than are, have been uh, used uh, certainly in the standards. Um, so I don't know whether we do need to test everything at 70, like it's been done at uh, 1, 5, and 3, and contribute to those databases. But I think we all know that's either never going to happen or will certainly take a long time. So I, I, what are we going to do in the meantime? And I think another approach might be to um, try to generalize. Um, th there are uh, specific alloy materials that are used to make a lot of implants these days, that they, they're made to certain specifications. Uh, so there are standards uh, about the metallurgy of these materials. Um, and so if you have a, a specific implant in a subject or a patient and you know exactly what it's made of, uh, you could use data from force measurements at specific fields, so B0s and spatial field gradients, and then you could just extrapolate it to what the worst case in your magnet might be to determine whether you could go ahead or not. Um, and I think, you know, that should be generalizable to any kind of implant device because the forces are independent of mass and, and you can determine an upper bound and the torque as well. Um, so, so that could be an approach uh, that, that might be useful uh, for well, for, our, for implants uh, for which you know the materials uh, that are involved, and there's just no testing that's available. Um, so just talking about RF induced tissue heating, um, uh, these are really the electric fields coming from RF coil, which induce the electrical currents uh, in our implant. Uh, and we get a buildup of electrical charge, particularly for long, thin, elongated implants. Uh, and the worst is when we have a so-called antenna effect where we get a standing wave current pattern at a certain length, so the resonant length. And this, uh, uh, so we get a charge build up at the tip, as you can see here, uh, and this generates electrical fields in the tissue and electrical fields generate eddy currents, which dissipate energy and turn into heat. Uh, and so it's, it's a scattered electric field is, is what we're really more concerned about. Um, so the shape is important. And as I mentioned, uh, for more one dimensional uh, objects, we get this antenna effect. So you get a standing wave uh, at a certain length, which is resonant, um, where, where it can support, uh, say, half a wavelength. Um, uh, and, and you get this excess charge, electrical charge buildup at the end with these electric fields. Um, uh, in reality, the, uh, the, the resonant effect or the peak effect is uh, anywhere from about a quarter to a half of the wavelength because um, the, uh, um, you know, it's, it's conductive tissue, so that extends the effective wavelength uh, beyond the length of the actual implant itself. Uh, and the resin length for 70 is anywhere from 40 to 90 millimeters for most typical soft tissues in the body. And it's a bit longer at three Tesla and longer again at 1.5 Tesla. Uh, so you can see when we're imaging uh, like active device like pacemakers with 50 centimeter leads, um, it, it might even be safer to image them at three Tesla uh, because of the resin length effect. Uh, and again, the effect is maximum when the incident field is parallel to your implant uh, and the SAR depends on, on the, the magnitude of this electric field and also the phase along the length of the implant. Um, so we can consider maybe two scenarios for, for imaging people with implants. One is what the implant is located far from the RF coil. Um, so some energy, so this is simulations uh, done by Nuruddin et al, where they, they had a head transmit coil and they were looking at this hip prosthesis you can see right here. And this is the SAR map where you can see there's a lot of energy deposited uh, in, in the head area, some traveling bit down the extremities, but, but very, very, very little uh, reaching the location of the hip implant here. So there's really no concern for any orif induced heating at that location. Um, and so examples are you might have a total knee prosthesis and you're using a brain, you're imaging the brain with a T or head coil, or likewise, you may have an aneurysm clip in your brain, uh, but you're imaging the knee and you've ruled out any dangerous magnetic forces. So uh, is there any RF induced heating? Well, there's not going to be. So in that case, it would be pretty much safe to, to, to go ahead with that exam. Um, so the second scenario is, of course, when we have the implant actually within the RF transmit field itself or close to it. And here now you need to do uh, uh, a lot more, uh, uh, take a lot more care to determine whether something's safe or not. So this is a study from Andrew Webb's group back in 2014, looking at these uh, uh, dental retainer wires. You can see them located here. Uh, and they do uh, physical phantom experiments and simulations. So comparing simulation uh, uh, temperature rises to measured temperature rises. And this is uh, as a function of the length of the wire. 
So again, you can see there's a resonant length effect here for uh, wires around 40, 50 millimeters in length. But again, they, the maximum temperature rise they, they uh, simulated and measured was only 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that was when they went in at five times the, the regulatory power limit. Um, and it, the, the simulations, uh, the, the position and anthropomorphic models, uh, the, the position of the maximum, sorry, did not change. Um, so again, that gave them confidence and certainly we image these as a matter of routine now on our, on our 17. Um, cranial fixation devices, you can see they're usually quite small. They, they, the surgery, they would cut the skull like this. And when they put the skull cap back on, they, they just fix the skull in place. You can see that the SAR, uh, there's some SAR hotspots at the end. So the electric field will be left right in this figure. But again, the increases in SAR are really quite small uh, in this situation. And when they did uh, modeling, you can see that the, the location of the maximum SAR, which is in this location right here, uh, this is where they implanted the devices. Um, you can see that it, uh, the, with the implants in place, it didn't actually change anything at all. Um, and again, other studies where they found a, a range of devices, maximum temperature increases of less than one degree Celsius. So we tend to image uh, CFDs all the time. Uh, we, we do look at them if they're particularly close together because the SAR effects can add together. Um, but because it's of where it's located, it's not in terms of sensitive tissue and uh, 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 we feel that there's not really any issue with this. If they had a very large device or a mesh, let's say over their head, we would uh, probably not image that. Um, there's been a good study from a group, Andreas Bitz's group in Germany, looking at aneurysm clips. Uh, where again, you can see the effect of the electric field, incident field is parallel to the clip, where you get a maximum SAR, whereas if the electric field is perpendicular to the clip, you get very little energy coupling into the clip. Um, they uh, use this to determine uh, so-called conservative electric fields. So if we were to constrain, make sure the temperature did not exceed 39 degrees Celsius in normal operating mode or 40 degrees in first level mode, what electric fields could we expose the clip to to make sure that those temperatures were not exceeded? Uh, and again, the, uh, the temperature is in red here. You can see um, uh, the dotted line is for normal uh, RF mode. Uh, and this is in a model phantom uh, with a strip line transmitter just transmitting into a phantom. Uh, and again, this is a function of the length of the clips. You can see for these resonant lengths, 40, 50 millimeters, uh, the temperature increases. We're, we're, we're well, quite quite large, I guess you could see here. Uh, and so if you want to make sure that, the, that say, um, you do not exceed this limit of 39 Celsius, you would constrain the electric field in blue here. So for shorter clips, you can go in with a higher electric field. And then for uh, uh, clips in the resonant land, you would have to use a, a less electric field. And so they were proposing the use of this uh, so-called conservative electric fields to make sure you do not exceed temperature limits. And they did simulations then in anthropomorphic body models with conventional birdcage coils. Uh, and uh, again, they constrained the input power uh, so that these local star levels were not exceeded anywhere. And they, they found that for the shorter clips, there was really no appreciable temperature increase. And for lo longer clips, uh, they did find uh, some of their simulation scenarios where the temperature rise increased above 39 degrees, but, but none of them exceeded 40 degrees. In, in any of their scenarios. Um, and again, they, they went from conservative electric fields to conservative B1 plus root mean square value or input power to the coil. Uh, again, just to make sure they didn't exceed these temperature limits. Um, so if you, if you had a patient and you didn't know anything about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the aneurysm clip in this case, uh, you, you could uh, assume the worst case scenario and just uh, transmit in with like three or four watts of power um, there's not much you can do with three or four watts of power, I think. So I'm not sure how useful that would be uh, really uh, in, in many situations. Uh, so there are a lot of intricacies when you're doing simulations. Um, it depends on the location of the implant and the tissue heterogeneity. Uh, and phantom-based measurements are very useful, but you really have to do simulations. Um, and the details of the transmit coil, whether it's a bird cage or a loop array or even an array of dipole antennas, uh, really changes the electrical field distribution inside as well. And then ultimately, we want to know what the temperature is doing. So uh, going from SAR to temperature uh, has a number of additional difficulties. There's various uh, bioheat transfer equations that are known, um, and they really need to be. Uh, there's various blood perfusion models as well, which people are using 
and again there's still a bit of work uh, to do to validate which one is the most appropriate and and uh, you know even in patients who may have impaired uh, term regula regula regulation um i just throw up this table here because this is um the iec document from 2015 and this is the, the new version that came out last year uh, and you may notice that there's a column missing here uh, this column here uh, is no longer mentioned in the new standard um, so this is for uh, maximum local tissue temperature uh, which was the same 3940 uh, and again that's just been dropped I, I think there was uh, no agreement on on this local tissue temperature uh, effect and I think a lot of the previous simulation studies were, were using these numbers uh, and you saw that in the simulation studies I just showed uh, but there's, there's no mention of this now uh, in, in the new standard uh, they refer to previous documentation uh, which I'll show in a minute um, and even the um, the temperature rises in the 2015 document were for core tissue temperature, not specifically aimed at local tissue temperature. Um, so these two documents, oops, I don't know why it's doing all this. Uh, this is going to be slow. Okay. Uh, so the ICNRP came out with a document in 2020 where they, they uh, distinguish different uh, tissue types being uh, thermally sensitive or not so sensitive where uh, these are the local temperature rises that, that would not lead to any adverse effects. Um, this is for uh, limited exposure, uh, not necessarily raised implants, just local tissue temperatures in general. And the FDA guideline document um, uh, for, for manufacturers, for, imp for devices, um, uh, again, distinguished between terminally sensitive and insensitive tissues. Uh, and the feeling was that uh, if you've done testing on a, an implant which creates after 15 minutes of scanning a temperature rise of four degrees celsius but then you can image that person for one hour without a cooling period so the assumption is that that these temperature rises are, are really not so significant so so i really wonder whether a lot of the studies that are out there so far at 70 where people are making sure that the temperature rise doesn't exceed one degree celsius are just being overly conservative because certainly the new regulations uh, it's it, it's 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 not specified that that must be kept that way so I guess that's something that, that, that we as a community need to debate a bit further. Um, yeah, so, so, so we, we did a study where we wanted to look at the effects of often just heating across field strands because we had uh, some surgeons wants to image um, uh, patients with orthopedic screws uh, within the ORF transmit field. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we did a study, uh, bird cage coils produce a very inhomogeneous electric field. Um, uh, and so we wanted a model system where we could get a uniform uh, excitation. So we just use a dipole antenna model. You can see this, uh, we use screws of different lengths uh, located in a, a uniform uh, tissue mimicking material, mimicking bone, in fact. Um, and, and we just did simulations to, to look at the maximum SAR. And here you can see the SAR for, for short screws is almost, there's very little. Uh, and as the screws get longer, uh, you get more and more uh, peaks are usually at the tip of the screw, and this is looking at the um, uh, the, the peaks are uh, as a function of the implant length. Again, you can see this resonant length effect, uh, and uh, a 70 in bone is around 78 millimeters. Uh, and we can do measurements where we, we constrain how much power we put into the dipole to get a, a B1 plus field of two microtesla at the location of the screw right here. And then when we compare it across field strengths, you can see that. Uh, as you go to higher fields, the SAR is actually getting lower um, in this case. And uh, the resonant length is shorter because the wavelength is shorter, but uh, the, the peak SAR is actually decreasing. Um, so I, I guess people had a, an assumption that as you go to higher fields, um, uh, the, the, the SAR is actually getting worse, but that's not necessarily the case. It really depends on, on many factors. Um, so we got the same trend when we controlled for electric field or global average SAR at that location as well. Um, so the, the SAR is really dominated by the resonant length effect. So if you look at the 3T and 7T data, you might think that uh, for any um, uh, any implant uh, shorter than 100 millimeters, that the 7T is actually worse. Uh, um, but uh, if you start looking at the material in which it's embedded, it's the 7T data. Uh, this is what I showed you a minute ago for, for the 78 millimeter screw where it's, it's worse. Uh, if the screw is embedded in muscle, it's um, got a shorter wavelength because of the dielectric properties of muscle tissue is different. It's got a higher conductivity and permittivity, and also there's the, it's, it's less amplitude as well. And so you can see that the SAR is, is dramatically different uh, just because of whatever material the screw was embedded within. And now if you do the simulation of the 3T in muscle, you can again see now for the same implant, 
lens, 78 millimeters. The 3 t is actually worse in this case. Uh, and there's the original simulation data done in 70 hours, sorry, in, uh, both of them done in bone material. Um, I think when you're looking at uh, studies of orphan juice heating, uh, I think we have to be conscious about uh, exactly what implant lengths, uh, because I think it's the implant length relative to the resonant lengths at whatever frequency and whatever tissue you're, you're looking at, which really determines uh, what the star is going to be. Um, and I'll just mention as well that there's, uh, it's been known for a long time that um, you know, even at 1.5 Tesla, this is the, uh, a study done by Murbach et al. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, that they found that uh, in many situations, the, uh, the, these local uh, star limits are, uh, are vastly exceeded. As you can see in different anatomical areas here, the 40 watts per kilo limit is, is exceeded in many situations, uh, almost 120 watts per kilo in that, in that situation. Uh, but again, the, the body can deal with that. I think studies have shown that up to maybe 200 to 300 watts per kilo is, is, is the territory where you start getting uh, uh, noticeable health effects uh, on individuals. Um, another way of, uh, uh, interesting way of uh, imaging implants at 70, some recent research uh, is to use parallel transmit to steer the E fields away from the implant. Uh, so this is just a, a single uh, a two channel body coil, a three test that where you can see when it's driven in quadrature in, in the, the blue here. So we're looking at temperature rise as a function of time where, versus this so-called implant friendly mode where, where they were able to, to reduce the, the magnitude of the electric fields at the location of the implant. So, uh, and there's been some other studies since then. This is the deep brain stimulator electrodes uh, where you can see the electrodes in the center of the brain and they were able to make sure the electric fields were very low at that location. Uh, and again, when they, Rather than in a birdcage coil or a four channel coil or an eight channel transmit coil, you can see they're, they're getting uh, quite significant re reductions in the, in the uh, local SAR uh, for the left side of the brain or the right side of the brain. So again, I think this is a very, uh, uh, a lot of uh, potential uh, for the future, a lot more of obviously research and validation work to be done here. Uh, so in general, many objects I think can be scanned routinely um, if you've ruled out any dangerous magnetic effects. Uh, so any small objects within the transmit field, uh, we would image fairly routinely. Um, objects located far from the transmit coil, like whole hip and knee replacements, and uh, a lot of implants down the body, we would just image fairly routinely as well. Um, and other objects, if, if we're not sure about the magnetic forces or they're close to the rough coil, we always do on a case-by-case -case basis, getting as much information as we can and doing risk-benefit analyses, et cetera. Lower SAR protocols don't tend to work very well because we're usually at the limit of the SAR anyway. Uh, and we've imaged many patients. I've lost uh, probably over 600 patients and subjects with various implants and lots of tattoos and stuff like this. So I guess there's a growing history of safe use of a lot of 70 sites around the world now uh, for, for imaging people with, with implants. Okay, so I'll just wrap up here um, with uh, just some logistics. Um, we do have a 70 safety team uh, with the various stakeholders who are knowledgeable about the safety aspects of 70, uh, and we develop and review our policies and procedures. Um, uh, and again, it's a fast evolving field. So obviously we, we do meet every so often just to make sure we're, we're keeping abreast of new developments. Uh, we developed specific uh, 70 operational and emergency procedures. Uh, we, we keep an eye on the clinical indication for, for what, what exams are appropriate or not appropriate in 70. And as I said, it's a fast changing environment as well. Uh, we do have a core group of technologists who run the scanner. Um, they've experienced what to do with implants. They do a lot of, a lot of the triage work and call me or one of the radiologists uh, for, for things that they're not sure about. Uh, the patient handling and setup is quite different from 3T. The table doesn't move up and down, for example. Uh, you've got to be very careful positioning the, the, the patient or subject within the RF coil. Uh, we've used dielectric pads. You've got to be careful in the placement of those as well and dealing with uh, vestibular activation as well. Uh, and also what to do if we have a patient uh, who's got some sort of fever or a term of regulatory compromise. We, we do actually control for that. Um, and they're knowledgeable about how to make SAR changes. We, we're usually right at the limit of what the scanner will allow us. So there's usually on the fly Parameter changes required in our small tech group are really good at doing that. Uh, and again, emergency procedures. I mean, um, if, if the pa patient codes in the magnet, the table does move very slowly. You can pull it out very quickly. Uh, you induce a lot of nausea in the person if you do that, um, but you just need to be aware of that. And again, there's a lot more helium in, in these 17 magnets compared to what we're used to at lower fields. Uh, the, 
the workflow is a lot more difficult. The pre-screening is more, a lot more involved. Um, and so we, we, we do have to uh, be careful who we send to the 7C for imaging on a given day. And um, we're trying to assess any implants beforehand as much as possible. And again, it's just trying to get as much information about the device as possible. Uh, have we looked at it before? Has it been cleared? Uh, are there x-rays available? Uh, we can use handheld firming detectors. Uh, is a conditional 3T? And are, is there anything in the literature is, and is it relevant to what we're looking at uh, in our case? Okay, so just to summarize then, um, I think when we move to 7T, there's certainly some additional safety considerations we need to be aware of. Um, uh, there are many safety aspects that are familiar to us from imaging at lower fields, but some are just uh, exasperated when we go to 7T. Uh, this dizziness and this silver activation is, is, is something that we do need to be very aware of. Uh, we, we can't image very young children due to this weight limit. Uh, and pregnancy is still something we, we, we don't do at the moment. Um, so again, I'm not sure, uh, hopefully there'll be some movement on that in the future. There's some studies uh, already looking at SAR in, in, in younger children in particular, so that's promising. Uh, implanted devices is, is remains challenging, but there's a growing history of safe use. And I think uh, PTX is now, uh, I think what the first manufacturer may get regulatory clearance later this year, uh, if all goes well, from the FDA to begin to do PTX um, so, so that's quite exciting. And there's a number of uh, review papers for people who are interested. Uh, so I'd just like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge some of my co-workers. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is the Q&A time. Um, so uh, for the question, and then we also have some uh, books going online. I will see how we can uh, yeah. So let's start from uh, many, many questions, but I'll just start from um, uh, the, the issue of implants. Um, there's so many implants, and it's very hard to test them all. So I mean, that's a, uh, I mean, the solution is one of already, but I'm just wondering from the pre-test uh, test data, can you predict whether the implants will be safe in certain Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you can do that. That's what I was kind of suggesting that if you know what the material is, the alloy, for example, that made the implant, and you know the testing conditions for magnetic forces, um, uh, uh, for certain translational force um, that it was tested at, uh, you can just extrapolate to whatever the, 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 the spatial gradients are on your magnets or what the worst case scenario might be that your patient could be exposed to. So I think you can do that. And I think that's probably going to be the most practical approach for us in the high field community is just to try and establish that data uh, definitively. Uh, and I think there is some data out there already where I think Terry Woods and FDA did measure some of that. Um, so that could be a good starting point for us. Um, and again, if you can, it, it'll probably be easier to get that information from the manufacturers of exactly what's in the implants rather than getting them to do the testing. So I think you can certainly do that. And the torque, I guess, you, you can get an upper bound on what the torque is going to be as well. So I think um, uh, that's uh, I think that's definitely going to be the most pragmatic approach for us. Uh, or feeding, I think, is again slightly different. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of wonder, uh, a lot of the heating for small devices is not that severe in, in, in my estimation from what I can see anyway. Okay, so so we haven't really been doing too much with PTX. Um, just some small scale research studies. We had a lot of problems for almost two years, uh, instabilities and crashes and whatnot. Uh, so we're, we're we're certainly not using it clinically. And uh, as I said, only one or two small studies, and we have not imaged any people with these devices on the PTX side. Um, so yeah, that's that's a, definitely a question for the future, I guess. Um, 
I think with the universal pulses, that's something on my mind as well, because uh, there's been some studies now where they've looked at uh, some, you know, people with large pathologies, which changes the brain structure to a certain extent. And maybe some of the UPs are fairly robust against that. But what happens when there's an implant in the field of view? Uh, I don't know if anyone's looked at that, but that's probably the next uh, question. So, um, yeah, that, that could really change uh, <laughs> Well, it'd be interesting to see how those uh, universal pulse uh, approaches work in those scenarios, but we certainly haven't looked at that yet. Right. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, there's another question. I have a question about uh, semi-permanent tattoos, for example, eyeballs. At Martin's Center, they are forbidden in certain cities, regardless of their age. Do you have any rationale for this? Yeah, so, so these tattoos on the eyelid, yeah, we, we don't image those. Um, again, I don't know, that was our local safety committee. Um, yeah, because of where it is, it's right in the eye. Uh, we decided not to image those. So if we get patients who have these, sometimes they're permanent, uh, we just uh, put them on a 3T. Uh, again, that's just because of lack of data. I, I don't know it's necessarily worse, but we just can't say one way or the other. So we just don't image them, yeah. Any questions about the audience here? Do you see the wonderful levels of SMP reaching out to the city in one of the states on the level of the or do you think we can assess the problem to the government? Well, uh, I mean, certainly it would be better if the manufacturers were to do the testing, but it's very expensive to do this kind of testing, uh, particularly the feeding uh, and to, to come up with these uh, documents where you certify something is safe or well, and more conditional, let's say, at 70. So, uh, I mean, there just has not been much activity from the manufacturers. Um, I mean, we as a community can and should, I guess, uh, try and put some pressure on as much as we possibly can. But, um, you know, We've had clinical 17 now for six years and or almost six years. And uh, I guess there, there hasn't been too much movement in that I've seen in, in that time. So I think we could be waiting a long time for this to, to actually, for the manufacturers to solve the problem. Uh, I don't know, we we were doing some testing on uh, 150 devices at the moment. Um, but again, that's only a snapshot of what's out there uh, and whether we could use the approach of trying to extrapolate data from maybe lower fields or uh, sp uh, specific uh, testing situations to what we have on our particular magnet design uh, may just be a pragmatic approach for certainly for magnetic forces. And it, it could be that we're just going to have to take responsibility for that ourselves. But again, it's, it's, it, there's just so many devices out there. It's, it's, just a, it's hard to see how, how we're going to get over this problem. Uh, probably not. Um, I think, uh, you know, the electric fields don't necessarily follow the magnetic fields uh, in 70. So I, I don't think you can necess necessarily, you're proposing just measure B1 plus on the scanner. Not terribly familiar with them. So I, I'm not sure if that's possible or not. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks for that question. Yeah, we uh, the, the the signal dropout is worse on the right hand side, I guess, because of uh, uh, circuit polarization. Uh, for, for the well, certainly an art seems terramagnet. I guess it might be the same in Phillips. Um, but uh, so yeah, when we have this problem as well that we can't fit both in, and we we would always just go with the one on the right hand side. I think when, when I made the pads, I made the right hand pad a bit thicker. Uh, than the left hand side pad just just for that for that very reason because there was more of a deficit on on the right hand side so that's what is what we would do uh, i understand that data from here uh suggests that just putting it on one side the right side might give a bad you know, i wouldn't mind seeing that data that would be interesting we, we never tried that we would just we just tried a few different things when we started off and that's what we landed on um yeah so so if you're um if you cannot fit the pads in or in general, and like it's usually low down in the brain where you start losing, um, you know, uh, signal, what we tend to do is uh, just have a reduced field of view. So we would, uh, uh, you know, rather than imaging the whole brain, we would do another scan where we just limit the field of view. We do very tight B0 shimming over that. We, we increase the transmit power uh, to get as much power in there as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so that 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 will definitely uh, help uh, if you just do a restricted field of view and restricted shimming. But of course, it's an extra acquisition, um, and I think that's really all you can do with the standard single transmit Nova head coil. Um, you know, and that's that's our approach. Okay, I see no question from online and uh, here. Um... Thank you so much, and you uh, this is uh, again a great talk. Um, I have a question and then we will launch. And then, uh, thank you, uh, everybody uh, for coming here and uh, in person. And then thank you, everybody, for joining online. We'll see you uh, next month. Thank you. Yeah.